Club and welcome to the True Podcast. Please introduce yourself. Hi everyone, my name is Amanda McDonough and I am a deaf actor, I'm author of the book Ready to Be Heard, um, and I um, do motivational speaking as well. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today. Oh, it's my pleasure. We all should be supporting each other. So I'm happy to be here. Please tell everyone about you and your story. Well, I was born hearing and I started losing my hearing when I was seven years old. Um, I started acting professionally in Hollywood around the same time. Um, As I got older, my hearing got worse and worse and worse, but because there was not really any hard of hearing or deaf people openly identifying that way in Hollywood at the time, I felt I needed to hide my hearing loss. Um, As I got older, my hearing got worse and worse and worse until one day I became 100% deaf and completely mute. So I had to teach myself to talk again. Um, I had never met another deaf person, so I had to teach myself sign language and I teach myself to lip read. Why did you hide your hearing loss from the people around you? Really, I think, especially like 1990 when I was born, this idea of disability um, was always introduced to me as a negative, awful thing. Like, I I grew up terrified of this idea of becoming a deaf person because I thought that meant, oh, I'm disabled. I can't have a job. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't do this. I can't do that. I can't be a successful actor. Um, Lists and lists and lists of things that I couldn't do. It wasn't until I became 100% deaf myself and still was looking and searching for those, those role models, those representatives in the media that I couldn't see. But I was like, you know what? It's up to me. If I don't do it, who else is going to? Um, So I hit it for shame because of that idea. Were there differences in how people treat you now that you identify as deaf? Do you find that there are differences in how you're treated from before that time to now? Yes, absolutely. Um, When I had enough um, hearing to kind of pass as a hearing person, um, people just kind of assumed that I was I was normal, and they treated me well, just normal. But when I became deaf and started, you know, being proud of my deaf identity, not being afraid of saying I am a proud deaf woman, um, using sign language more to communicate and actually asking for accommodations instead of just struggling and suffering myself and being like, no, I I need an interpreter constant, or no, I need captioning to watch your show, or so on and so forth, just standing up for myself. People really became very uncomfortable around me, even people that I grew up with. They're like, oh, we don't know how to talk with you anymore. Like, why not? I'm still the same person, like, It's not a problem, really. Um, So yes, absolutely. I think in my experience, that has to do more with the other person, the way they treat you, other than how you see yourself. They're unsure of, because they're unfamiliar with disability of being a deaf person that they don't know how to behave or to speak to us. Um, What are your thoughts uh, on that? Yeah, I think people are afraid of the unknown. 
like I was afraid of becoming deaf because I didn't understand what that meant because I didn't have those role models representations in, the, in Hollywood to show me, oh, being deaf, I can have a job. I can communicate. I can have hearing friends. I can, I just recently, this month, this past month, got married. I married a hearing guy. Um, so it, it really, people are afraid of what they don't already know. And I think that's something that is finally being brought to light in 2020 is that it's okay to not know, but to learn and to dedicate the time to learning. It's the same with all people who are differently abled. I, I mean, I don't understand fully everything that a person who is blind is going through, what accessibility they need, but so I have to ask, I have to, you know, be the one to be like, what can I do to communicate with you better? Um, and, and really that's the key to it. Um, and I hope that people start just taking a step over that boundary and being like, how can I communicate with you? What do you, what do you want? Do you need anything? I'm like, no, I'm cool. But. I agree. And while we are on the topic of disabled representation in Hollywood. Talk to me about the representation or the non-representation in Hollywood and how you, the barriers you face because of those things. Um, awesome question. Um, first of all, our, our representation in Hollywood as a disabled person, I mean, differently able people, we, we make up what over 20% of the population. And most people will experience some type of disability at some point in their life. Um, so it's so important that we're represented and accurately represented on TV, film, uh, in magazines, books, everything. Um, so that people, you know, aren't afraid of that unknown. Um, I think it was in 2016, only 5% of disabled characters were actually played by disabled actors. And there really is harm to casting a non-deaf person, for example, to play a deaf character. Because little kids, like myself who were growing up trying to look for those role models, I was seeing on TV, if I saw a deaf character, they were angry, they were lesser than, they were pitied. And that's still to this day, unfortunately, um, a trend that we see is disabled characters tend to be angry or not portrayed as human or they're only there for a second because so that you can say oh yeah I had a disabled character but they had like one line and it didn't affect the the storyline at all um so we still have a lot of progress to make um we already have increased that number by 12 percent between um 2016 and 2018 as far as um disabled actors portraying themselves on TV, accurate representation on television. But there's still so few roles for us. As a deaf actress, I normally will get maybe one or two auditions a year. My hearing friends who have the same body type, same, um, would go for like the same types of roles, like girl next door, blah, blah, blah. Um, they're getting two to three auditions a week. So it's a huge difference. Um, there was a point in my life where I had to change my representation because they told me that I had to accept that I would only be allowed to audition for deaf roles because I'm a deaf actor. But as an actor and as a disabled person, I'm human. I'm human. I have the same emotions. I go through the same pain, the same struggles, uh, the same fights as any other human. So I would love the opportunity to just audition as a human being um, and to see people like me on screen representing humans. Um, 
So that's something that really I'm hoping will continue to improve in Hollywood in the coming years. And that was my next question was how difficult has it been for you to get parts because you are deaf? Um, and have you ever been cast as just the girl next door or someone who is not deaf, but their character is not centered around their disability? but just a character. Have you come across any parts, any roles like that? Have you had the opportunity to do that? Um, it, it's definitely been a, a struggle for me personally. I, I started acting back when I identified as a hearing person, um, where I, I didn't have, you know, a visible and I was hard of hearing, so I, I could really pass as a caring person. And I was at that time going on three auditions a week. Um, and then when I started acting as a deaf actress and being open about my disability, my identity as a person, my preferred language, um, it definitely has become a lot more difficult for me to get roles um, or even auditions. But there have been many times where I have hit, I have felt it necessary to hide my deafness um, and audition for roles. And I have been booked for those roles. And then when they go to look at my social media where I'm actively, you know, saying, oh, I'm a deaf person, or they go to my websites or things like that, where I say, I'm a deaf person. Um, I have magically been released from several roles over the years. And at the last minute, too, like the day before my fitting um, for costumes for characters. And this has happened again and again and again. And so it, it can get really frustrating. Hollywood in itself is a hard industry. It's hard to be successful in it. It's one in a million, you know, um, are successful. But it's definitely more difficult um, as an openly disabled actor to do that but I'm hopeful I'm positive I'm thinking positive about it <laughs> um what is the one thing that is lacking in terms of accessibility when it comes to the deaf community enforcement um it, it's a, a huge struggle for us. Um, there really isn't any um, consequences for not providing interpreters, captioners, um, <laughs> all of these things. Um, and it's not enforced um, by the police or really anyone. So uh, every time I want to go on an audition, I have to organize getting an interpreter. So technically, it's supposed to be because of the ADA, I'm supposed to be provided that service. Um, but probably 99% of the time, if I have to go to audition, if I am doing a speaking engagement, um, if I am you know, helping out, volunteering at a school, whatever I'm doing, 99% of the time, if I'm going to go to a concert, like listen to music, um, see a musical, go to a TV, like a movie theater, 99% of the time, it's all that responsibility of scheduling, contacting, organizing, and sometimes even paying interpreters or captioners is, is stuck on me because the ADA is, is not enforced. People, businesses don't feel the need to know about that. Um, so it's a struggle and I feel like everything I do, I have to teach um businesses or, or people or organizers and okay this is what the ada says like so i i think for all people who are differently abled we have to have a lot of patience because like every day we're explaining laws and rights 
um, to people and having to find ways to explain it that doesn't sound like we're complaining or like we're being angry, angry disabled people, like no, like staying away from that, you know, stereotype. Um, so yeah, for, for the deaf is definitely lack of knowledge and lack of enforcement. I think if we are angry, we have a right to be angry because of the lack of knowledge when it comes to the ADA and mm -hmm. the ADA is not only physical access, it is interpreters, it is captioning, it is much more than a ramp for someone like me who mm -hmm. uses a wheelchair. And so if we are angry, I think we have every right to be. <laughs> it definitely adds up over time. And we, we do we do have a right to be. Um, I try always to think of, you know, from because I had the benefit of being here in person at the beginning of my life. and and seeing that perspective, I always try to think, okay, this person maybe has never met another deaf person. And most of the people that I meet, but like, wait, you, you can't hear. And I am so privileged because at one point in my life, I was mute, um, but I taught myself to speak. And so being a speaking, lip reading deaf person, that is privilege that gives me a lot more opportunities than many of my community members. Um, so I just, I try to keep that in mind that, you know, one, I'm privileged and two, I understand that, oh, hey, maybe they've never met me before. I have to try to be patient, but sometimes it's hard. I mean, there's only so many times I can explain that deaf people can drive. <laughs> we can do jobs we we can act we can like so funny i think that's the disabled community is we are able to do things and i'm not sure how or when the non-disabled community decided we could not do those things mm -hmm. but it's very exhausting to explain over and over mm -hmm. and over yeah <laughs> um, i i can do that don't worry oh i got this don't worry <laughs> yeah I might do it a little bit differently than you do, but I can do it. I got this. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's funny sometimes trying to explain it to people that. And it's also amazing being a deaf person because I, would, I was, felt really alone my entire childhood growing up. It wasn't until I found other deaf people, the community, um, the support from the disabled community saying, there's nothing wrong with you. I don't care what the media, what the world says, you have value. You can do whatever you put your mind to. Like, I, I love that we have a community that is so large. And if we can just connect this community, we would have so much power to change this world and make people hear us. And that's one of the reasons that I, I named my book Ready to be Heard. Um, it's, it's me saying, hey, I, I hid who I was. I hid out of, out of shame that I didn't need to have. Because if I had that support, if I had those disabled or differently abled, whichever you prefer, um, role models in the media, I would have, been able to use my voice a long time ago 
but it took me a long time to learn that. And, and that's why I, I wrote my book, because I wanted kids growing up feeling alone to know they have value. It's okay to be different. It's okay to have good days and bad days. And I think that's so important within our community because we could be so powerful. We just have to unite and, and support each other and learn from each other, really. Exactly. And that is the goal behind the true project is to unite our community and give ourselves power and say we are powerful and if we unite we are that much more powerful. Yes. Um I want to wrap up by getting your thoughts on the ADA as we commemorate the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing, actually, because I was born in 1990, the year it was um, enacted. Um, so I just turned 30 with the ADA. Uh, and it's amazing to see, you know, that that was really the first stepping block to, that is helping me become the woman I am today. Without it, I would not have access to anything. I would not have had access to my college education. I would not have access to Netflix. I wouldn't have caption. I would have like, there's so many things that I, I wouldn't, if I didn't have the ADA behind me and that foundation, I mean, we still have ways to go to build on that foundation. But if I didn't have that foundation, I wouldn't be the woman I am today. Um, and so I'm extremely grateful to the ADA and proud to be turning 30 with it. So, yay, happy birthday, ADA. <laughs> Makes me feel very old. Um, I was 13 when the ADA was signed. Um, That's not old. <laughs> Girl, so, you're young and thriving. Thank you. So, <laughs> there is a distinct time I remember before the ADA mm -hmm. and after the ADA. So it is fascinating to me that you were born the year it was signed. You do not know anything before the ADA. Mm -hmm. And I know you are thankful for the ADA. But where can we improve? Where do we go from here? The mm -hmm. ADA is 30 years old. Seemingly not old, but in terms of accessibility, mm -hmm. old enough. So where, where do we go from here? It, exactly that. I mean, ADA was a good foundation, and I'm really blessed to have been able to be born that, that same year that 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 humans right were really established for people with disabilities. Um, but yeah, that foundation, it's been 30 years. That's a really long time. Life has changed. We now have the internet. We have cell phones. We have the whole world, the, the ways we communicate, the ways we connect, um, our, our entire infrastructure has completely changed in 30 years. We've developed so much as human, human beings. It's time to reevaluate the ADA and add, add to it and um, adjust some of the laws to make it more accessible, um, to make it, find a way to start enforcing it better and educating the world about this is the law and this law is really about respect and the rights of a human being to be able to enter a building for me to be able to order starbucks i mean just simple little things that most people don't think about every day um especially now after covid my life as a deaf person has 
become a little more of a struggle because masks um, take away uh, that, that skill I have of, of lip reading. I can't use that anymore. So I can't hear, <laughs> I can't see you, I rely on writing completely. Um, so it, it's really like, you know, times change and it's time for the ADA to grow with us because we're growing. I could not agree more. Amanda, we want to thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us today and for participating in the True Project. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Thank you for, you know, asking me to come and thank you for all of the work that you do every day. I love following you on social media. So keep at it, girl. Thank you so much.